And my wife went back to work, so she said, it's the thing about having children is it is a bit tedious because you get up early with them. You get up about half past six. <laughs> By about half seven, you're running out of ideas, right? <laughs> so the government say, not too much telly, not too much telly. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they love a bit of telly. Never once has this little boy turned to me and gone, there's nothing on, Dad. <laughs> so I put him by the telly, right? He's watching Thomas the Tank Engine. I'm reading about the budget deficit, which is very high, as we know, and you should be more worried about it. <laughs> He's watching Thomas. I'm reading the paper. He's watching Thomas. I'm reading the paper. Suddenly, I'm watching Thomas. <laughs> Two years later, I'm a massive fan of Thomas. <laughs> I've got to know the trains again, haven't I? Their little personalities, you know. You think, oh, Toby's turned up. This will be a blinder, this will. <laughs> Toby's turned up. <laughs> no, because... Cos where he's like a, He's not a proper diesel or a steamy, and he's square, he plays up a bit, you know? <laughs> so you're guaranteed a good episode with Toby. Now, the worst thing about having children, you're thoroughly enjoying an episode of Thomas. The little boy looks up at me and thinks, he's enjoying himself a bit. I'm not having that. <laughs> I think I'll go off and top myself, all right? <laughs> so he goes and gets in the oven. <laughs> Keep me on my toes, and you have to go, hot, hot, hot! Hot, hot, hot! <laughs> and you miss the end of Thomas. <laughs> it ruins the rest of your day. Ruins it. It gnaws away at you. You think, how did that end? Like, <laughs> and it's not the sort of show you can just pop down the pub that night <laughs> and start asking about, you know what I mean? <laughs> start saying to people, I don't suppose you saw Thomas this morning, did you? <laughs> they brought the orchestra over, right, to um, play out the fate, the Sodar fate. They've only sent Percy to pick them up, haven't they? <laughs> I don't know what the fat control is thinking about sometimes, I really don't. <laughs> we know it's a job for Gordon, don't we? <laughs> Possibly Henry at a push. Come clean with you, though. <laughs> the main reason I have an issue with Robert Panson and Twilight is that when I was at school, I realised I wasn't going to be good at sport, I wasn't going to be academic. So I thought, well, if I'm rubbish at everything, then I'll have to do drama, because that's what you do if you're shit. <laughs> <laughs> Some drama students in, awkward laughs. <laughs> What they're gonna do. <laughs> Look at me, Jack. I'm making an angry tree. <laughs> but that was me. I thought that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do drama. I'm gonna, I'm gonna audition for every single play that my school puts on. And every single play that I went in to audition for in my school, I learned all of my lines. I went in in front of the drama teacher. I gave it my all. And every single play that I auditioned for, Robert Pattinson got cast in the lead role. <laughs> and I got cast as Villager Six, the twat who used to have to stand at the corner of the stage and do nothing for an hour and a half whilst his parents looked on ashamed. <laughs> and that's not to say I didn't throw myself into these roles. When I was playing Villager Six, I would give it my all. The drama teacher would be like, Jack, at the end of the scene, all you have to do, Robert's doing his final speech, is walk very quietly from that side of the stage to this side of the stage and exit quietly without making a fuss. I was like, oh my God, sir, you are a fool. When Jack Whitehall is on stage, he does not walk, he glides. <laughs> The other one they'd have to do right, and this happened on several occasions, <laughs> the school were forced to write parts into plays so my parents wouldn't complain to the headmaster. Do you realise how humiliating that is? When you're stood with all of your friends and peers in front of a cast list, and yeah, I have my name on it, but everyone knows there is no emu in the manger. <laughs> I look like a dick. 
the worst thing about it, and it still cuts me up, and I cannot get over it, is the one very simple and plain fact. And that is, Robert Pattinson is not a good actor. He wasn't a good actor at school, he's not a good actor now. I've been to see him in these Twilight films several times, and every time I watch him on the screen, through the web of tears, I'm astounded how my bigger truck of shit he is. All the guy does is mope around, giving this one same surly look. And that's a look that he stole off me! Because this thing is But I'm not bitter, I'm very happy. <laughs> Primark, Primark. They've started selling Che Guevara t-shirts. That's a fitting testament to the man's legacy, isn't it? Che Guevara. <laughs> che Guevara he fought for the poor and oppressed in South America. Now his face has been stitched onto t-shirts by the poor and oppressed in South East Asia. <laughs> to be worn by the poor and oppressed in South East London. <laughs> As for, I, as for I stay when I come to London, South East London, kind of Dulwich sort of area, there's a lot, a lot of knife crime, a lot, a lot of crime. I, I, don't, I don't really know the solutions to that particular problem, but I think a start would be to maybe close, close the shops that sell the weapons in the first place. Now you get these high street shops that sell crossbows to guys in shell suits. Not these places. <laughs> shops that sell thousands of baseball bats every year, but have never sold any baseballs. Oh, the Peckham Rye, Red Sox. I've not had a game in a while. <laughs> I was in one of these places, done a bit of research, and the only security measure, if you want to buy a violent weapon, is you need to fill in a form, leaving your name and address, so if anything happens, you can be traced for questioning. Now, that's the theory. But what self-respecting nutcase? <laughs> Buying a weapon would leave their real name and address. <laughs> now, I picture some police investigation team going through the book and saying, excuse me, excuse me, shop owner, says here, you sold a samurai sword to Bert and Ernie. <laughs> from 24 Sesame Street. <laughs> and some new guy cop, he'd get sent on a wild goose chase somewhere. Sesame Street not showing up on the sat nav. <laughs> Putting down the window for directions. Going, excuse me, mate, excuse me. Can you tell me? <laughs> how to get... How to get to Sesame, that's a wind-up, isn't it? <laughs> I went in, I paid a pound, a door opened, and sure enough, there was a sea of elves. Tiny little Thai women in little pink jackets, and they're so lovely, the Thai people, so welcoming and lovely. I walked in, still feeling a bit cocky about my height, David. I walked in, I went, behold. <laughs> they all went like this. Ah! <laughs> Which encouraged me. I went, yes! That's right, my little friends! Who will touch the flesh of the giant? <laughs> and they all went, ah! I went, ha, 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 I'm exaggerating a little bit. When I was at my peak of cockiness, these wonderful, welcoming, smiling women suddenly parted, as if they planned it. They parted to reveal this hobbit. <laughs> this evil hobbit. <laughs> and she clip-clopped out of the pack. <laughs> Clip-clop doesn't make sense. <laughs> she had hooves, she had little hooves. She didn't, she was normal. <laughs> I looked at her and I went, hello, and she went like this. <laughs> And I went, ooh. She said, I will rub you. And I went, ooh. And then she took me by the hand. Sorry. Just giving you a chance to see how badly all my clothes fit me at this stage. <laughs> by the hand into a little room. She got me to lie down in front of her and she stood over me and she went like this. What do you want? I went, massage. <laughs> she said, yes. What sort of massage? I 
I said, I don't know what the options are. <laughs> she said, you can have normal or you can have Thai. <laughs> and this, ladies and gentlemen, is where I made one of the worst decisions of my entire life. <laughs> Has anyone been for a Thai massage? Yeah. How would you describe that? Painful is polite, thank you. I would describe it as an elf kicking the shit out of me. <laughs> she beat the living shit out of me. If you get offered one for free, turn it down. She was punching me in the throat. I said, I'm giving you a pound, you little bastard. <laughs> I, <laughs> they made me dress in a little pair of paper pants. Can you imagine, right? I was coming up in bruises during the massage. At the end of the hour, I was covered in bruises in paper pants. I looked like a fat, shaved leopard. <laughs> and I was sneaking out thinking, thank God that's over. And I got to the door and I heard this. I've not finished. <laughs> How many of you have ever played with the Wii? <laughs> that doesn't count, right? <laughs> this is a Wii game. Ooh, I'm stroking a pony. That's a Wii game, right? Ooh, I'm feeding sugar cues to a unicorn and it's gonna pull out rainbows that I can paint onto Mario's house. <laughs> That's not gaming. This is gaming. Oh my God, I'm in a gun battle. Which one of these buttons isn't crouch? Every game involves crouching. You're always crouching behind oil barrels or conveniently placed little walls. You're always crouching. But they put the crouch button in different places on different games. And you get panicked in the middle of a space marine laser battle and you're pressing any button at all and suddenly your man is just waddling around the battlefield. <laughs> just staring up at you going, Jesus, press anything. Ain't not toggle maps. <laughs> There's a game called Metal Gear Solid where you play a character called Snake. Yes. And when Snake dies, the camera pulls cinematically up from above him and the voice of the man Snake has been speaking to on his comms unit goes, Snake, Snake, Snake! <laughs> Every time he dies. <laughs> when I play as Snake, he dies a lot. <laughs> But the man's sadness seems undiminished by the regularity with which he has to mourn Snake. <laughs> you think once or twice he'd go, ah, Snake. <laughs> you think there'd be some sort of debriefing session in this international espionage organisation where they go, Jesus, Mick, you're very disappointed about the death of Snake, aren't you? <laughs> well, he's one of the best agents we've ever... He was not, Mick. We've looked back over the mission logs. His behaviour in the field was erratic at best. <laughs> he spent most of the time just waddling around the battlefield for no good reason. Just waddling around, he was toggling maps, then items, then weapons, then weapons, then items, then maps. He didn't know where he was going. He had to get behind that, he couldn't get behind it. He kept running at it. He'd run at it, and then he'd try running at it again. <laughs> he ran at it once, he missed. He had to run around in a little circle. <laughs> he tried jumping at it, jumping. Then he tried touching it, touching it, then jump and touch, jump and touch, jump, crouch and touch, jump, crouch and touch. Then he looked up, then he looked down. Then he picked up a crowbar. Then he put the crowbar down. Then he looked up. The crouch, weapons, items, items, crouch, crouch, not crouch, crouch, weapons, items, items. A robot attacked him. He gave him his rations. <laughs> He's the worst agent we've ever had. Hello, sir. How are you today? <laughs> I said, no, thank you. And he genuinely got the hump and said, no, thank you, what? I said, sorry, no thank you, please. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm phoning from EDF. I said, I'm not interested. He said, I haven't told you what it is yet. I said, I know exactly why you're ringing. You're ringing to offer me a free season ticket to Wembley plus unlimited access to Dirty Brenda's all-night knocking shop with as many chocolate hobnobs as I can eat. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not. I'm ringing to talk about your domestic fuel bills. <laughs> I said, well, why didn't you say that in the first place? <laughs> Keep talking, son! He said, well, sir, because he didn't get the sarcasm. <laughs> he said, how would you feel about paying less for your gas? I said, honestly, he said, yes. I said, I reckon I'd feel exactly the same, but I'd be paying less for me gas. <laughs> Thank you.
He said, can I ask you, who's your current supplier? I said, oh, it's Big Pete. He comes round every Thursday on a moped. <laughs> I said, oh, sorry, gas! I thought you meant electricity. I said, it's British gas. He said, can I ask what you chose then, sir? I said, well, it's a funny story. I needed some gas and I live in Britain and I don't know what it was, but they seem to be ticking all the right boxes. <laughs> And at this point, he genuinely got the hump and said, do you know what, I think I'll ring someone else who will answer my questions less sarcastically. I said, yeah, you can phone someone else, they'll be less sarcastic, they'll probably stay on the phone longer, but they'll still end up saying no to you anyway. <laughs> I said, now, I don't know who's providing your current rejection, but if you were to switch to me, I would combine the rejection with the sarcasm and save you up to 15% a year on your cold calling time. And do you know what he did then? Do you know what he did? He tried to offer me nectar points. Let me tell you something about nectar points, ladies and gentlemen. I spent the last two years collecting nectar points. Do you know what they've got? Enough for a tiny little jar of honey. <laughs> I've been better off collecting bloody nectar. <laughs> and I'm glad you laughed at that joke, cos when I did it a month ago in Ireland, it got nothing. <laughs> Honestly, God, I did a gig two nights in Ireland. First night, I did that joke about the nectar of the nectar points, got nothing, I walked off stage, and the bloke that travels around me went, I said, why did that joke not get a laugh? The nectar of the nectar points, he went, oh, I know why. They don't have nectar points in Ireland. <laughs> what are you telling me now for after the gig? <laughs> he said, don't worry, tomorrow night, say Tesco's points. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I don't know what's worse. The fact that he suggested that, or the fact that half of you are now looking at me going, well, Lee, what happened? Did it work? What's that? <laughs> that leave us hanging, Lee. Did it work? What about nickel points? Ask the points. Sat there and I'm having this curry with me mates and I said, listen lads, I said, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry. He said, what for? I said, well, you've come all the way down here. I said, there's no one here. And he said, yeah, it was a bit shit. Uh, <laughs> I said, well, to be honest with you lads, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of giving it up. So what do you mean? I said, I'm thinking of giving this comedy up. I said, I'm just not making enough money. I said, we're, we're, you know, I'm not getting more money on the mortgage. We're struggling at the house. I said, no, I, just don't, I just don't think I can make it work. And then my mates turned around and said, don't do that. Give it another go. Give it one more year. Give it maybe 18 months. Just see, just see what happens. Just give it one more go. Don't give up now, because you'll never know what would have happened. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's brilliant, that. I said, what you've just done there, lads. I said, I'm never going to forget that. I said, if I ever get booked on something big, something like, like live at the Apollo, <laughs> I said, you're coming. All 14 of you are coming. You two aren't. I said, all 14. <laughs> all 14 of you are coming. I said, because we're on this journey together. And me mates went, yeah, OK. Twelve months later, I got a phone call from the producer of Live at the Apollo. He said, John, we'd like you to come on Live at the Apollo. I said, I would love to come on Live at the Apollo. I said, do I get any guest tickets? He said, well, normally you can have two. <laughs> I said, I need 14. <laughs> he said, you cheeky bastard, you're lucky to be on the show. <laughs> I said, I know, but I genuinely need 14. He said, well, why on earth do you need 14? I said, I need them for me mates. He said, you what? He said, why on earth do you need 14 tickets for your mate? And I just couldn't think of anything else to say. I just went, one of them's not got long. <laughs> he said, I'll see what I can do. He put the phone down, he phoned me back 10 minutes later. He still works on the show. He phoned me back 10 minutes later. He said, John, I've got you 14 tickets. <laughs> For the recording alive at the Apollo, I said, oh, thanks. He said, John. I went, what? He said, be strong. <laughs> I said, I'll do my best. I put the phone down. I phoned my mates up. I said, lads, you're not going to believe what's just happened. I said, I've been booked on live at the Apollo. And what's more, you're coming. All 14 of you are coming, but one of you has got to wear a cap. <laughs> and of course, I'm willing to accept we have the worst national instrument in the world. We do the bagpipes, the missing link between noise and sound. <laughs> How the hell did we end up with that? 
Because you think about when it came about, it was at the same time that all the European countries were giving us these wonderful musical instruments. Handcrafted, the Germans gave us uh, pianos, the Austrians gave us violins, the Italians gave us flutes, the French, you know, gave us the, whatever they, you know, gave us. <laughs> Probably a triangle or something. <laughs> Ding, there you go, I have a tire, tire, Ding, this, this makes a good noise. What more do you want? A ting. You can ting, ting, ting as many times as you <laughs> well, well, the jury's out on your one, but we like the others. <laughs> and at some point, all the instruments must have got together in one room to see if they could create some kind of harmonious unison, some sort of beautiful movement. If it worked, it would be the world's first orchestra. <gasps> but no one knew if it was going to work or not. And everyone's warming up. <laughs> tinkle, tinkle, pom, pom, pom. And the conductor, and he points to the piano player. And the piano player. Do, 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 do. And he looks for support. And in comes the flute, instinctively. Do, 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 do. <laughs> There's bound to be a few bum notes they've just got together. <laughs> Tough crowd, Apollo. <laughs> Start again. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and then maybe the, the violin. <laughs> and then the whole orchestra in one instinctive movement of beauty. <laughs> and the conductor's like, yes. We did it! The world's first orchestra. Is everyone here, by the way? <laughs> Hang on! Sorry, I'm late. I've been with her now uh, 24 years now. And uh, I'll tell you one thing, man. Uh, it's not love. <laughs> <laughs> love is fleeting, but uh, spite, that stays. <laughs> I'm not leaving her. That would make her happy. I'm in it for the long haul, man. <laughs> 24 years with the same woman. And I'll be honest with you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wake up every morning of my life and I walk down the stairs and I think, you know, I'm gonna kill her today. <laughs> I'm gonna sneak up behind her and hit her in the head with a shovel. She won't see it. Coming. <laughs> and I know she's uh, walking down the stairs behind me. Every day, I'm gonna push him. I'm gonna push this fat bastard down the stairs. He never picks up his shit. I'm gonna put a screwdriver in his eye. I'm gonna let him rot, then we circle each other. In the kitchen, spitting fire and hate. And then we have tea and toast, and everything's better. And that's why breakfast is the most important meal of the day. These assets are amazing. 100,000 people with their hands in the air because there's no space to get them down. <laughs> Waiting for a helicopter to fly by with a rope ladder. Thank God, fly me to the toilet now. <laughs> amazing when the DJs come on at Glastonbury, man, at the festivals. They're treated like gods. People go nuts. Why? DJs don't make music, they just deliver it. <laughs> the musicians are chefs, DJs are waiters. They are. The waiter doesn't get a standing ovation when he brings the plates out, does he? Thank you very much. <laughs> the waiter doesn't fanny around with your food when he gets to the table, does he? He's not there going, yeah, yeah. Put your knives and forks in the air and wave them like you just don't care. This is the restaurant remix. Now listen to me. Table number seven, swap with table three. You freaking vegetarians are driving me mental. I'm sticking a chicken ticker on your cabbage and lentils. Gaspacho. Everybody say, Gaspacho. Yo, skinny model with your celery stick. 
Legging it to the ladies to make yourself sick. You got to get some flesh on them tiny little hips. So here's my solution. Burger, egg, and chips. Everybody say, gazpacho. It's cold soup. Gazpacho. Raise your champagne glass to your lip. And then give me a oversized tip. Dance out style. Come follow me. Come follow me. You wanted the monkfish, you're having the lamb. You wanted the rabbit, you're getting the lamb. Pepper, honey, ice cream, salt, honey, jelly. Your Rabbi Cohen, have the pork belly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love music. It's my big thing, music. I can't do without it. I get a lot of it. I buy a lot of my music online, you know? This is what I love about buying music online. If you like Beyonce, you might like Pink. <laughs> How cool is that? They should do that everywhere with everything. You go down the pub, have 10 pints of lager, the barmaid says, if you like 10 pints of lager, you might like a kebab. <laughs> go down the kebab place, the bloke's there going, if you like 10 pints of lager and a kebab, you might like a fight. <laughs> go outside, beat the crap out of some innocent bystander. Copper comes up and says, if you like beating the crap out of innocent bystanders, you might like to join the police. <laughs> the girl from the BBC comes up to me, she said, John, listen, Rod is about to finish, so you need to get in position. She leads me behind the word Apollo. What you do is you stand behind the word Apollo, the word Apollo comes up, your name gets announced, you walk on, that sounds dead easy. And it probably is, if you're not shitting yourself. <laughs> I get led behind the word Apollo. I'm stood rocking from side to side. I'm trying to remember, trying to remember me material. I'm stood rocking from side to side. I'm stood behind the letter L. I'm stood like that. I'm about to go on the biggest gig of my life, shitting myself, trying to remember me material. When she goes to walk away, before she walks away, she just stops. She said, John, has anyone told you about the change in transmission time? <laughs> like, oh. She said, has anyone told you about the change in transmission time? I said, what are you talking about? She said, the BBC, they've changed the slot. She said, we were originally going to be on after 10. We're now going to be on sometime between 9 and 10 on a Saturday night. I went, so what? She said, well, that means you'll allow two twats, one wank, not and stronger, and walked off. <laughs> I forgot everything I was going to say. <laughs> I only had three words in my head. At that point, I heard Rod Gilbert say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Bishop. Instinctively, I walked forward. What I should have done is wait for the sign to come up. <laughs> I bang my head on the letter L. If you ever watch it, if you ever watch it, just fill the stage with smoke to cover it, which meant I couldn't see where I was going. It was like being in an Ultravox video. I come out, <laughs> and then I just stood there, and I just started talking, and, 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 and fair enough, it went OK. And then afterwards, I walked off. And what happens afterwards? They take you to a bar afterwards, and the only people allowed into the bar are the actors who have been on the stage, the odd person from the BBC. The odd, the odd agent, and selected, selected VIP guests. On the night that I was on, they only had 14 selected <laughs> VIP guests who were already pissed by the time they arrived. <laughs> They're passing the cap between each other. Oh, you put it on, I'm cured, look at me, I'm cured. <laughs> you go into the bar, it's a VIP bar. Me and my mates aren't used to a VIP bar. We just get pissed. They drink everything in the bar. They drink the bar, that's right. The girl from the BBC comes up to me again, she says, John, look, I'm sorry, there's nothing left, but I've organised you a car back to your hotel. So my mates all turn around and went, well, what about us? I said, well, there's 14 of you. They went, oh, you've changed. <laughs> Say, where are your keys? And you go, oh, the keys, they're where I put them. You are a putter. And to sum up, you're a good human being. Uh, you work hard, you try hard, you're probably quite successful. The other group, the leavers, or shithead devils, <laughs> to give them their full title. Uh, if you say to them, where are your keys? They'll go, <laughs> wherever I left them. <laughs> 
you will die in an accident. <laughs> I mean, that's just a fact. You have to know where things are. That is a fact. And here's the problem in relationships. You tend to find you get a putter with a lever, right? Because you can never have two putters together because they will kill each other uh, <laughs> over which way the beans should face in the cupboard. They go westwards. Oh, do they? In your face! <laughs> Of course, you can never have two levers together because they will die of dysentery. <laughs> so, what you tend to find is you get a putter with a lever, and what happens is the most annoying thing about levers is that they're more fun to be around. They're happier people because, they, you know, they go around dropping things and knocking stuff over, and the putter goes around, oh, that goes there, and that goes tiny. <laughs> I'm valid, I'm valid in the relationship. <laughs> levers drop things because they're enjoying life. They don't, who cares where my keys are? Tinfoil shiny! <laughs> <laughs> Not a good mixer in a relationship to have a mixture of, let's make a collage, let's make a list. <laughs> and I, I make lists for a very simple reason. That I, like to, I like to control my life, right? And I, uh, my view on happiness is kind of like that, happiness. It goes up and it's down, it's, it's wavy, and the happier you are, the sadder you'll be. It always evens out. And if you're impulsive, you will have days where everything's perfect and it's an amazing day, but you'll have days where everything goes bad and you'll fluctuate a lot like that. You see, I can't handle that, so I keep my way fairly shallow. I, oh, that was a nice Kit Kat. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> and if I try to be impulsive, I don't know how it's done and I just ruin days. Like, my, uh, the last girlfriend I went out with, uh, we, were, we were chatting, it was the first, first time we'd spoken, and she said, oh, this is nice, let's go out on a date. What would you like to do? And I thought, don't be honest about what you'd like to do, because it's probably weird. Say something sexy and impulsive, right? I said something so impulsive, even I didn't really know I was going to say it until after it had happened. Right? <laughs> she said, oh, this has been nice, what would you like to do? And I went, oh, let's go ice skating. <laughs> Which is easily the shittest sentence I have ever said. <laughs> I mean, the phrase, would you like to go ice skating, is on a par with, would you like a fire bath? Just an experience and a range of temperatures your body does not need to go through, right? If you go ice skating, you will fall and you will hurt yourself, and it's your fault. Right? <laughs> ice has evolved. It's got slippery for a reason. It doesn't want us on its back. <laughs> I don't mind falling over. I fall over in life. I like a drink. And you trip, and you put your hands out, and you try and minimise the damage, don't you? That doesn't work on ice. On ice, you splay out, and you slide for another 50 yards, <laughs> surrounded by out-of-control teenagers with razor blades on their shoes.